talk about contributions that animals provide society. And there's a wide range of things that animals bring to a culture or to a community. And so we're going to talk about some of these that we'll see both globally and locally. So animals provide a number of different things to society, everything from being a food product to clothing. They produce byproducts that we utilize, um, things like manure for fuel and fertilizer, power and work. So they have jobs that they often assist with. And we also see things like sport and recreation, um, using animals for different types of competitions, um, everything from being used in a religious capacity to maybe being companion, and then also we utilize animals pretty regularly for research. Now, animals provide food, and food can come from a number of different sources. And so often this starts the conversation of why would we eat animal protein? And animal protein is considered a complete protein meaning that it has all of the essential amino acids that a, a human um, or other animal, if they're a carnivore, might need for the body. Now, you can get those amino acids from other plant-based sources. You just have to be a little more calculated about it because most plants are not a complete source of amino acids. Um, you're also going to see it provide things like vitamins and minerals, energy. It's also a very, very good fat source. And oftentimes, this is that point in my classroom where everyone goes, oh gosh, what if I'm a vegan? Or what if I'm vegetarian? Or what if I dot, dot, dot. And it's important to understand that just because you're in my classroom and um, this is a livestock production class, it's important to understand that everyone is allowed to consume what is good for their body, what they feel is the best fit for their body. And that might look like just plants. It might look like no dairy. It might look like no gluten. And, you know, we really need to give space to everyone um, to be allowed to eat what feels good for their body. And so some people that's going to be animal protein. And that doesn't mean that if you're in my class and you don't eat animal-based products, you're going to get stoned. That's not how we work. So just know that, um, you know, when we present these things, that this is a um, under understanding of how animal science is integrated into society, even if maybe you do some things differently. Now, animal products that you're going to see in terms of food sources are things like meat, milk, eggs, um, blood, fat, bones, and byproducts. We don't see blood and fat and bones on store shelves in America as much as you would in other nations, um, but we'll see those things consumed pretty commonly throughout the globe. Now, when we talk about what provides more energy to the world food supply, if it's plants or if it's protein from animals, um, we need to understand that most of the diets around the globe are about 83% plant-based, and then that other 17% comes from animal-based products. So it's not like the world is only consuming meat, or it's not like the world, you know, over-consumes meat, but understanding that about 17% of calories worldwide come from some type of animal-based source. And this is kind of a breakdown so that you can kind of understand what we would define that 83%, where that comes from in terms of plant-based products, and then what we see the animal products break down to in category. So again, we see world consumption is about 63% um, plants if we're just looking at protein. So instead of the last slide that was talking about calories, we're now moving into protein and understanding that the world consumes about 63% of their plants um, as a protein source, and then most of that other protein comes from animal-based sources, or 37%. The United States is a little bit higher, so you'll notice we actually consume most of our protein from animal-based sources, um, so we're a little bit different than what you'll see worldwide, and most of that comes down to access to products. And common species you're going to see consumed are going to be cattle, swine, sheep, goat, chicken, and turkey. And you'll see some exotic things like alpaca, llamas, yaks, deers, horses, elks, kangaroos, and guinea pigs kind of handled throughout the world. Um, obviously, it's not as normal for us to serve up guinea pigs here in the United States. We would normally see those in a pet store. Um, however, in South America, guinea pig is very common. Um, same thing, kangaroo, very common in places like Australia and New Zealand. Um, you'll see yaks a lot in places like Nepal. So just some differences in some of the animals where protein or milk might be coming from.
Now, besides just the food category, animals contribute things like clothing. So we see different types of fibers that are utilized from animals. So things like wool, fiber, um, hides. So we might see, you know, goose down, inside comforters. We might see rugs or clothing, like sweaters made out of wool. Um, hides we'll often see turned into things like, you know, leather belts or boots or different um, other products, carpets, things like that. So animal-based uh, fiber is actually becoming more popular in the United States. It definitely became less uh, preferable, I would say, kind of after World War II, and we started moving to more synthetic fibers. But now that we're moving back to more sustainable clothing, um, you're going to start seeing more of the animal-based products come back. Now, the other big thing that's always very important to understand is a lot of times we look at calculations about, you know, this animal's ruining the environment or how dare we just eat an animal for food. And again, there is room in my classroom for whatever philosophical belief you might have coming into it. Um, but what I do want to do is educate you on the understanding that when an animal is slaughtered, they're not just consumed for their meat. Um, that carcass is used for a number of byproducts that don't often get publicized or talked about. And so we're going to see animal-based um, byproducts be present in a number of different things that you might not realize on store shelves. So everything from things like candles, cosmetics, paints, jello, um, fabrics, you know, common drugs that you're going to see on the store shelf. And so I really like this diagram because it really shows you that in one pig. Okay, so this is one. We're showing all of the different products that you might see, okay, on store shelves that maybe you didn't realize came from animal-based sources. And so it's under important to understand that we don't just slaughter animals for meat. The last byproduct that you're going to see is going to be fertilizer and fuel. And so um, animal waste is a huge source of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. And so these are utilized often in other agriculture industries for fertilizers um, to kind of help grow maybe corn or soybean meal. We actually use a large amount of chicken manure in our organic rice operation. And so there's just different ways this gets utilized. If we're talking about how we would see kind of fertilizer and fuel utilized um, on the globe, you might see it used as things like campfire fuel. So um, you'll take little little cow patties or yak patties and use those to burn for fuel. So there's lots of different ways that we see animal waste utilized. However, this is something that has to be managed because if um, the drain off or the runoff of fertilizers or manure is too great, it can actually end up in affecting waterways. And so this is something that is very highly managed in livestock production. And we also see animals used for jobs. So we might not see, you know, oxen or horses and plows here in the United States anymore. We do still see that around the globe in other developing countries. But we might see dogs utilized for things like helping um, the blind navigate um, a street or a store. And so you'll see animals used for different jobs throughout the United States. Um, they just don't look as um, traditional as what we would think of when you look at this picture up here on the left in India. So another job that we use animals for currently right now, and this is a big one, especially in California right now, after all of the horrific fires we've had the last five years, is plant management. And this is starting to be a really big component of fire management in California. We actually just used a very large herd of goats to work through and graze through the Bidwell Park, the lower part of it. And they are exceptional because those animals eat everything and anything. And they're a helpful um, asset when it comes to fire control. The other thing that goats do is they actually will ingest seeds that we don't want of some type of invasive plant. One of the big ones up here is star thistle. And as that seed moves through their digestive system, it actually kills the seed and it's not able to sprout once it's popped out of the manure. And so that's a really helpful way for us to manage weeds. Um, we also see this as a way to kind of help conserve and restore lands that um, haven't been managed well and really getting them back down to a manageable space, allowing other smaller plants to be able to come through underbrush and just kind of helping maintain properties um, that might have a lot of fire load. So uh, plant management is starting to be a very big thing that we see sheep and goats used for. 
And then sport and recreation um, is probably one of the bigger ways you're going to see animals also do work in the United States. So often we're using animals for competitions like um, horse jumping and rodeos. We might see um, them used in livestock shows. So if you've been a part of 4-H or FFA, this is also a great way that that occurs in the United States. Um, you might see dog competitions. You might see cat competitions. Um, someone I saw on YouTube last week was jumping a cow over a horse jump. So there's just lots of ways that we um, are uh, allowed to partner with and work with animals in a sport and recreation way. And it really is that sense of fun and emotional fulfillment um, that you get with that animal as you're competing. And then we also see animals used um, as kind of figures in religion as well as a way to maintain wealth in a culture. And we don't see this as much in the United States, but um, throughout different regions in the globe, you're going to see like in India, cattle are considered a deity. They're considered a god and they're sacred. And so we actually um, do not slaughter cattle in India. They can be utilized for milk, but not for meat. And so you'll see them just wandering around, hanging out in the street streets like you are here. It's pretty cute. And then you'll also see these guys used as forms of wealth. So if I need money, if I need a dowry, I'm going to either slaughter animals or gift animals to someone. Um, it's kind of a way to have a bank without having to have, you know, cash on hand. And then always the big one in the U.S. is animals as companions. And so you'll get to hear lots and lots about my crazy critters. These are only a few of them. Uh, and Yes, that is my husband on the left, and no, he does not know I use this picture for my lectures, so shh. Um, but these are my my little ones, so I've got a couple dogs, a couple cats, chickens. It's a wild ruckus around my house half the time, so uh, we strongly believe in adopting each one of those animals has been rescued, um, retrained, and rehabilitated, and so that's been a fun, fun project for me before I started uh, having cute little babies. And then we also see animals used for research. And so this is one of those controversial subjects where um, there unfortunately have been people in the past that have not done animal research well. Um, we've seen animal welfare and animal ethics um, lines crossed that were not appropriate. What I do want you to understand though is that research with animals can be done well. And so there's actually what we call an IACUC. It's a federal guidelines for research with animals. And that's something that we utilize here at Chico State anytime we're doing research projects to make sure that animals are being handled in a humane and ethical manner. And you're going to see us be really careful about, you know, how we submit projects, how those projects are followed through, that the guidelines are being um, responsibly utilized. And so animal research has brought a pretty phenomenal amount of advancement to the human culture and so we've seen this help with everything from aging to diabetes treatment understanding how to do replacement joint surgery um, and then understanding how do we create pharmaceuticals and so this is one of those hot topics where you know you want to make sure this is being done well because unfortunately you have people that have chosen not to do this ethically um, but it is something that has also created a lot of benefits to human culture so Let's talk about what did we learn this week. We covered everything from what is animal science, what can you do in animal science, how is animal science integrated into culture, and then what does it actually provide to you as an individual, as part of a, um, a nation or as part of the globe. And so what I want you to do right now is take some time to sit back, look back at that what do I need to know section, or just think back to your notes and I want you to take a couple minutes to really work through and just think about what are three big things that I took away today that kind of fit into those objectives. So go ahead and do that real quick. So anytime you get done with a lecture or a lab in my class, it's always going to be important to just take a few minutes, reflect back on those learning objectives, that what do I need to know section, think back to some of those main ideas that you're going to need to start paying attention to, and then really making sure you're reflecting on those notes, you're reflecting on that what do you need to know list um, before you get to your quiz. 
So this class, it's important to always be kind of reviewing material. Trying to cram for quizzes at the last minute is really hard in this class because we have so much content and it changes every week by subject. So it's just a lot of terminology and a lot of information. So that's kind of my recommendation to start breaking apart these lectures. I look forward to chatting with you this week in lab and I hope you're doing great. Have a great day.